The title we will be discussing today is Rick Bragg's The Best Cook in the World, Tales from My Mama's Table. Best-selling author Rick Bragg has written a delectable food memoir, cookbook, and loving tribute to a region, a vanishing history, a family, and especially to his mother. The Best Cook in the World includes 74 mouth-watering Bragg family recipes for classic Southern dishes passed down through generations. With this title, Rick Bragg finally preserves his heritage by telling the stories that framed his mother's cooking and education from childhood into old age. Because good food always has a good story, and a recipe, writes Bragg, is a story like anything else. Our reviewer today is Jerry Manley, local Fox TV chef and the former owner of Flower City Diner. Chef Manley was voted top Food Find DNC Critics' Choice Award for his fried chicken. We'll draw a name to receive a complimentary copy of Rick Bragg's book after our Q&A session, and I hope you'll please join me in welcoming Chef Jerry Manley to our podium. Thank you, Susan, very much. I'm going to raise this a little bit. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming. Uh, I just, um, I've talked to a couple of people here so far, but I just came back last night. I flew in from uh, Florida. I've been on a two-week uh, vacation uh, with my ex-wife and my ex-in-laws and my nine-year-old. And uh, so and seven of those days were spent at Disney, and my ex-wife said to me, Does, are you afraid to do this, or, you know, do this? And I go, no, that, this doesn't scare me. The vacation scared me with my ex in law but it went very well. Uh, my I, my nine-year-old had a great time, and my oldest is 37. My youngest is nine, so it was easier when I took the 37-year-old to Disney because I was way younger. So, but anyways, when I was first uh, when I first got the email in the mail, or in my in my uh, email, of course. Um, I read it, and I, maybe I didn't read it too close, but it, it looked to me like um, Diane wanted me to look at a local cookbook, read it, and give her my ideas about it. And that's kind of what I thought that was. Uh, and then this showed up in the mail. And I'm like, oh my, okay. So um, it's a novel, and I'm like, uh, well, I used to love to read. Uh, I used to read a lot of stuff. And uh, so I looked at it, and I'm like, okay, and I, I can read this. And, but in the past, like probably since my chef career, uh, which began about 2001, I've read only b nothing but cookbooks because anytime I'm reading something else, I always decide that might be a waste of my time. So uh, I looked in the back of the book first and I read the back of the cover and they compared the author to um, Pat Conroy. So uh, Pat Conroy was one of my favorite things to read. I love Pat Conroy. The Prince of Tides to me um, is pure poetry. Uh, and as a matter of fact, Pat Conroy, who passed a few years ago, uh, he had a cookbook. And I have Pat Conroy's cookbook, which is neat. And I, uh, when I read more about it, and it's Southern cooking. So um, anyone that's ever been to my restaurants and, and seen my menu, I've actually been accused of being a Southern black woman trapped in a white man's body because I love Southern food. So this could not be more appropriate for me to read. And I was really super excited to go through the, um, um, the recipes for it. So that, that to me um, was perfect. So, the other thing that was perfect for me is, even though the book came to me like three months ago, two months ago, um, I knew that this vacation was coming up. We'd been planning it for a long time. So I thought that what a great thing for me to do is to be on the beach and read. So I've been reading this book on the beach for the last 10 days. So it's actually been a great read for me and a great vacation. So uh, the only bad thing that happened was uh, my brand new iPhone 8 that I took all my notes on uh, about the book went swimming with me in Disney. Uh, and while it's weather or it's, it's water resistant, it's not waterproof. So that made me panic a little bit. So uh, between the last couple of days and on the plane coming home, I was able to, from memory, jot down uh, some of the notes, and I pretty much thought I remembered most of it. But um, let's get to the book. And, and so the the questions that came to me in the mail about you know what do I think about the title, the best cook in the world? Well. Um, that's actually my mom. So uh, the title, I, I would I'd look for, you know, see if she's in here. Because my mom was an amazing from scratch cook, and we'll, I'll tell you the similarities about that in a few minutes. But um, so as a chef, um, if I'd seen the book on the shelf, 
it would have probably, I would have probably picked it up and, and pawed through it to look at it. And once I saw all those really nice southern recipes, it for sure would have piqued my interest. And um, so, you know, I, I would have loved to have seen something like, um, you know, the best biscuit maker or something like that, be, or the best fried chicken person, because you know, that, that was me, of course. But in 2008, I got voted number one food find in Rochester for my fried chicken out of the Flower City Diner. So that was great. And I do love fried chicken. So I make very good fried chicken. So, and uh, the grits, there's, you know, grits are in here. The grits are a big part of Southern cooking. And uh, back when I first started the restaurant and started cooking and put grits on my menu, I would be lucky to sell a quart of grits a week. Uh, by the time I sold the Flower City Diner, we were going through gallons and gallons of it. Uh, I would spice it up and do all kinds of crazy things with grits, but um, I love to this day. Fish and grits, which is what I just had every day for 10 days for breakfast, is my favorite breakfast. Love it. So the book begins um, you know, with Rick and his mom uh, talking in present day. And then it goes, and it's the, the actual story gets into it. Uh, how many people out there have read the book? Anyone that has read the whole book? Oh, okay, good. So I won't, I won't, there's nothing really to spoil. There's not any surprises, but I'll, I'll go through a couple of the, the high points of it and, and tell you what I thought. Um, so it begins in the early 20s. Um, after um, he, you know, he kind of introduces his mom and they're talking at the table and he kind of talks about how you know, he wants to do this book with her. Um, she doesn't understand it because she doesn't, she thinks that all recipes are not written down, that she just knows what she knows. So in the beginning, being in the 20s, and it goes all the way through to about 1986. And then it comes back to present time a little bit. Now what I did, and I'm really glad I did this, is I read the book, and then I finished the whole thing, and then I went back and I started reading it from the beginning again. And that was great because I had actually forgot that it started with him and his mom, and that she kind of sums up a lot of the little stories and the little anecdotal things that are in there um, about characters, and there are a lot of crazy characters you know, down in the South. It's quite interesting. So that was a great way, if you do read the book, I think a great thing to do is to do that and then go back and, and remind yourself about what she said in the beginning. What I wish he had done, and which he did not do, um, and I kind of did that a little bit, um, is I wish he'd put a family tree in the beginning because I, whenever I read a book, I always take notes, and I did a lot of notes in this book here and there. Like, I, I hope I can keep this book now that they sent it. <laughs> so good I wrote it. But uh, anyways, um, so I kind of, uh, if he'd done a family tree, it would have been easier for me to look at and to remember who's who, because there's a lot of, down in the South, cousins, 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 fathers, cousins, and, and so it was sometimes a little bit hard to remember who was who. So it was good to take notes for me. And the book basically has like four, I think, main characters, and it starts out, um, with um, in the 1920s, uh, his great grandfather who was Jimmy, and then it comes down to uh, his uh, uh, Jimmy had uh, uh, a son named Charlie, and Charlie met Ava. So it's Jimmy, Charlie, Ava, um, who is the great grandmother. I mean the, the grandmother and the, and the grandfather, Charlie and Ava, and then it's Margaret who is the woman that we're writing about. Um, that's um, and then that's Rick Bragg's mom. So Rick is on the bottom. So even though it looks like my family tree, one branch going up, that's kind of how my family tree is because I'm from Dundee, but it's, um, it branches out to a lot of cousins and a lot of um, sisters and brothers. And uh, when uh, Rick told his mom that he was writing this book about her and her life and her stories and her recipes, um, she considered herself not even the best cook on her road. She considered herself to be the third best cook on her road, which is funny because her her sister, who is in this book a lot, uh, her sister, who is Edna, is a phenomenal cook as well. So that, um, that puts her in uh, what she considered to be the third best cook. And, uh, but as, as a son, he, of course, thinks his mom is the best cook. And it all goes back to, you know, being in the 20s, very poor times, going through the Depression. Um, but food seemed to always bring these people together, which food still to this day does. I mean, even with all the social media and everything else that's going on in this world, um, once you sit down at a dinner table and everyone puts their phones away, I mean, it's just a great place to make everyone happy. Um, and good food, and food that tastes good, uh, makes everybody happy, I think, because that's what I do. I try to cook good food. So even though they went through the Depression, they barely had a lot to eat sometimes. Uh, and they go through the recipes, most of these recipes in this book barely have four or five ingredients because that's what they had to work with. And what it shows you, uh, most importantly, and the same way I feel about cooking is that you don't need all these fancy ingredients 
you need good quality ingredients and you need to know how to respect them and cook them properly. And that's what it's all about, people doing the right thing with their food. And it's funny because if I'm ever at a cookout or somebody's house and they're cooking for me, I have to walk away. I can't watch. <laughs> and and, and uh, people always go me, they always say, just don't watch, just watch. Because I'm like, oh, that's not how you do that. But you know, everyone has their way of doing it and they think it's the, the, a great way. And it's, it is, it's a great way. So uh, you, you, you sometimes just have to go, okay, other people have different ways of cooking stuff, and they do. And she has like specifics on how to turn something, when to turn something, and um, what it's supposed to be look like and what it's supposed to smell like. Most of her things that when her son asks her, how do you know it's done? She says, well, just by the smell. And he says, well, what about the temperature of the oven? She says, how do I know the mysteries of your oven? And how do I know? I, and I don't know these people in their houses with what they do. So I just know what I know, which is so true about people that are cooks. When I first became a cook, I actually thought that I wanted to be a baker. And um, my mom was a great baker. And so I wanted to bake. So I started getting into baking. And I realized it was much like my rg and &E engineering job. It's you know exact measurements, uh, reading everything, making it perfect. And I very quickly learned that, no, I really wanted to be a cook because I just wanted to throw stuff in there and um, see if it worked. And if you have a good enough palate or the more you practice cooking, well, then you know, um, you kind of learn along the way. Well, this works and that works or that doesn't. There's one great story in here, and it's toward the end, talking about my mom being a great cook. My mom um, cooked from scratch. I grew up very, very poor. There's um, a little bit in here about um, being on um, assistance and welfare cheese, government cheese. I grew up on government cheese, so I know that how good that stuff was, and maybe that's a childhood memory of how good that was, but back then, when you eat cheese sandwiches and you're hungry, that was really good cheese. And my mom could make amazing macaroni and cheese out of that cheese, like this woman can. But uh, they talk about how um, when uh, Ricky was young, the circus came to town and something had made him mad, and he was going to run away with the circus. And it's funny because moms always know when the kids are about to run away. Somehow they just get, they, maybe it's just your packing or whatever, but I remember as a kid packing my bags and I was gonna run away. Well, Ricky's mom, she decided to throw together some smoked bologna and make fried bologna sandwiches. And you know, that smell, and of course, that deterred him from running away. And that's so relatable to me because I had my bags packed, I was leaving, walking out the door, and my mother is making homemade donuts. <laughs> now there's no way I'm going to leave when there's homemade donuts being made. And so it's just one of these things that moms just know that hey, the kids are leaving, I'll give them something to, to stick around for. So that was very funny and very relatable to me. And uh, um, my mom also, uh, she was a really, really super good pie maker. Um, she made from scratch coconut cream, chocolate cream, banana cream, and there's a whole section here about pies and making pies, and that was just um, very, very hilarious to me. So another thing that she brings up in here, and it's so true today, is food today just doesn't taste like food back then. And it's, that's so true, um, not only just because of uh, it, the, what's going on with um, certain species or whatever, but everything's been so ge genetically modified and it, all these uh, pesticides that it's true. And, and much of the stuff that they grew back then, they didn't have pesticides. Uh, and I, as a little boy, would walk through my grandmother's garden just like these people with two rocks in my hand, and I'm sure people here can relate to that, and we would crush the little caterpillars that would be eating the tomato plants. And that was our form of pesticides. And we did that for hours and hours. And then you got a tomato that tasted like a tomato. And it's hard to find, there's a lot of emphasis on tomatoes in this book. And it, it really truly is hard to find a really good tomato unless you grow it yourself. And I grew up um, with my, when I was younger with my first brood of children, I have four kids from my first marriage, and we had a farm. We had a 189 acre sheep farm uh, in the southern tier south of Dansville. So when they talk about butchering animals, um, and the, doing the chicken thing and all that. My kids have all actually plucked chickens. They've done that. They've been around when I butchered pigs. And, and so she not only talks about the tomatoes and the vegetables, but they talk about like just the, the, the proteins, like how chicken doesn't taste like chicken today. And it really doesn't. And unless you've raised your own livestock, you, you can appreciate that. And I always tell people when they ask me about growing up on the farm with my kids, 
uh, the, the biggest thing, the biggest difference ever from anything I ever raised, and we, we did chickens, we did meat rabbits, we did turkeys, um, sheep, I had a, it was mostly a sheep farm, and we raised pigs every year, but the biggest difference of anything that I ever raised, much like they talk about in this book, is pork. Uh, pork today has been raised to be lean, okay? I, I fattened my pigs up as much as I could with anything I could find that was bad for them, like breads, uh, a fresh deer kill along the side of the road, perfect for my pigs. Um, I never gave them antibiotics. I gave them, and, I, and toward the end of their life, they, I grained them with lots and lots of corn. So when you butcher a pig then like that, it's just such a different product than what you can get. So I encourage everybody to try to find a local farm that's doing something like that to get your stuff with. Because uh, Margaret mentions in the book about how funny her, it is to her, uh, this farm to table movement. And she goes, that's not a movement, that's how we grew up. And that's exactly how they grew up. They grew it and they ate it. And also in this book, you know, they, other than the uh, proteins of the, the pigs and the chickens, um, there are recipes in here for possum, which I've never had the privilege of. There are recipes in here for um, turtle soup with snapping turtles, which I have actually eaten a lot of turtle soup. Um, growing up, um, my grandparents were very poor potato farmers, uh, and my grandfather and uh, my aunts and uncles, um, while I didn't have possum, I did grow up on a lot of squirrel, which squirrel is delicious meat. Um, squirrels are their foragers, they eat nuts, um, it's great. Possums, yeah, not so much interest me because they're more of a carrion, you know, dead flesh eater kind of thing. Although you think about that, so are lobsters. So people, you know, that's, possums are basically the lobsters of the, uh, the earth. That, that, that they just eat that stuff. But I'm not going to eat a possum. I, however, did have sold raccoon to people who were going to eat it. And I've always wished that I had gone to one of those barbecues because I would have loved to try that. But I don't think anyone in here is going to read one of these recipes and go home and cook a possum. Although it is cooked with sweet potatoes, and I do love me some sweet potatoes. So that's... What's interesting to me um, was the fact that when it started, they were very, very poor. It came up to modern day times. They had, you know, they became more affluent. They got more money in the family. They didn't necessarily need to go back to a lot of these old ways, but they still stuck with some of the stuff that, that was from their youth and their childhood, and they still cooked it the exact same way. Beans were a staple. Pigs were a staple. And sometimes the, uh, the brothers of... Um, Margaret had to steal to, to survive, but they never stole more than they had to. So they had a very good conscience, and they knew what they could take and what they shouldn't take. And that was kind of funny because they would find themselves in a smokehouse with huge hams, stuff you know, they could grab, easily grab and run with, but they would just take like a couple of hocks, and they would run home, and they would use that to flavor a big pot of beans, which would carry them through for a week. And, of course, the fellow that owned those, the, the, those hawks would notice that, well, for some reason, his pig only had two legs. Where did they go? So he, he would catch on. And it, um, it, it's funny because nobody really turned on anybody, but they just, and that's when they started realizing, well, that's how they kind of knew that maybe we need to help these people out a little bit more. So there's a lot of stuff in there about people helping each other, people um, um, going through really tough times but getting through them, uh, and it's just, it's a wonderful book, and as far as I'm, um, like, cussing, uh, the worst thing that's written in this book is the initials SB, so that's the worst cussing that goes on in the book, because it's very funny that they, you know, they, they, they try to <laughs> keep it as clean as possible, but you know that they want to, in the worst way, call somebody a bad name, which is hilarious, and uh, I just feel that um, toward the end, when you read it, and you, and you read about this woman's life, and she's still, as the book ends, like in 2016 or 17, she's still alive. Um, she's talking to her um, son, and she has gone through and seen so much from cooking on a wood stove with wood and going through all her GE electric stoves, which is a big chapter about how many stoves she actually burnt through cooking, to today with what you know she sees in technology, and you think about that, and how much that a woman from the 20s, or her family began in the 20s, but a woman that is now, let's say, 85 years old, um, 
what they've seen in that lifetime blows me away to think about my nine-year-old who, what is he gonna see from now when he's 80 years old? It's just, I can't fathom or imagine what's gonna happen and, and just to know what she's seen and how she still reflects on just food, good people, and um, just uh, the fact that she's had a, a really hard life in the beginning and it came around to fruition. She saw her kids grow up, one of them obviously be an author, and that it all turned out great. So I recommend the book. Um, if you like to cook at all, it's well worth reading. Um, I think that um, it's gonna make me look at a couple of his other books and read them. One thing that's not in here, anything in, anywhere in this book is he very little touches upon his father. He touches on his mother a lot, but his father's really not talked about. So I, I, I think maybe that's maybe another book in the making. Maybe there's something out there that we could um, explore with that one if he ever does it. But I found the book to be a great read, an easy read, and the recipes are something that I took pictures of with my iPhone that I no longer have. But I will get another phone and take pictures of all the recipes so that I have them on file. So it was great. So if anyone has any questions, I'd be glad to. Yes, sir? Well, organic farming is funny because that means a lot of things now. It doesn't mean um, n absolutely no pesticides. There are guidelines for organic farmers to, uh, to what they can and what they can't do. So if you are a, a raise your own garden to be organic where you use absolutely nothing and you uh, harvest it, weed it yourself and pick it, that to me is true organic farming. I think that today so much stuff that says it's organic on it you have to be really careful. I, I don't trust a lot of stuff out there, but for the cost of things that, that, that are elevated a little bit as far as more than what you could buy other stuff for, um, if, if you can swing it, it's, is it probably best for your family? Is it best for to eat? Probably better than what anything else is that claims to be not organic. How about taste? Taste, good question. Um, we at the, I work at the Beachcomber now um, on Canisius Lake, and we are fortunate enough to get um, all our produce from a, a place called Old Silo Farms across the street, or across the lake. And they, organic, no pesticides. They, we get all our tomatoes, our produce from them. It's amazing. I mean, it's, it's flat out heirloom tomatoes, uh, their cucumbers, their squash, their, their zucchinis. Uh, the taste to me is unbelievable. And, 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 and here, I mean, now with, you know, with Wegmans, everything is seasonal. You can get anything any time of the year. But does it taste like a zucchini should taste like? No. Um, is it, it, are the tomatoes coming up from Mexico gassed and ripened on the truck? Yes. So um, anything that you can get organically local and you know the people and you can buy, I think that if you can talk to someone, find out exactly what they're doing, I say buy it all up. Uh, if you see it in the store and it's marked organic, I, I'm a little suspicious. But taste wise, it's great. Yes, sir. Oh, that's funny. You want me to <laughs> pick somebody, huh? Um, I, uh, I love talking food, and I love talking with uh, chefs in Rochester. And um, I have a weekly cooking show that I've had for 13 years on Fox. So I am lucky enough that I can call somebody up and uh, tell them that I'm going to give them about $8,000 worth of free TV promotion. Can I come to your kitchen and cook? And they're all like, oh my gosh, yes. So it's a great job to have to be able to get into and look at other restaurants. And when I do that, of course, they want, you know, what can I give you? Well, you can give me a free meal when I come in next time. So I have eaten in some of the best restaurants in Rochester, and I've eaten in some of the worst restaurants in Rochester. Um, I have two really strong favorites. Um, one is um, uh, Rocco on Monroe Avenue. It's uh, Mark Cupolo. He's a friend of mine. I think he is one of the best talented chefs uh, as far as raw talent and what he does with, he, it's Italian cooking, so Italian cooking is, is commonly minimal as far as ingredients, but he makes food amazing. Um, so I love his restaurant. And then we're lucky enough to have a, a person in this city that's been uh, awarded, or he, he was brought up as a nominee for a James Beard Award, and that's Art Rogers from um, Lento. And now Art is a chef's chef. He is a purist. He, he will take a tomato and cook it for you six different ways. And uh, he's, he's really into his craft. So those are two places that I think are must go. Lento's a little pricey. Rocco, uh, higher end, but not too bad. 
But of those two places, I think those are two must-go-to Rochester restaurants. Now, there's a lot of newer things popping up all the time, and there's new chefs coming through, and they're doing great stuff. The Cub Room's amazing. Uh, Char on East Avenue is a great restaurant in the uh, Strath Allen. Um, I have not yet got into those places, but I will. But um, those are my two favorite right there, yeah. But that, and then as far as people always ask me, what's my favorite, who's my favorite chef that's like a famous chef? Um, I've actually met two famous chefs that are one of, two of my favorites. I've sat next to Rick Bayless on a plane, uh, who is the uh, owner of Fonterra, uh, which is the, the number one rated Mexican restaurant in the country. And uh, I actually sat next to him three months before I was about to open a Mexican restaurant in Spencerport, which was really uncanny and ironic. And so he, and he was a great guy. But I've had been fortunate enough to meet many times and talk to Iron Chef Michael Simon. My son-in-law works for the Cleveland Cavaliers, and Michael Simon feeds the Cleveland Cavaliers. So um, he's always been one of my favorite Iron Chefs uh, because he's so into proteins and he's so into um, meat. And the, my dad was a butcher. Um, so I grew up surrounded by you know really good fine cuts of meat, and I, I, before you know now as a chef you have to be um, acclimated to these people that want all this vegan stuff and vegetarian. But I remember the first time when I had the Flower City Diner um, on East Avenue, and, and the waiter said someone needs to see you in the diner. And I walked out, and this woman said to me, "Do you have anything vegan on your menu?" And I said, "Not on purpose." <laughs> no. <laughs> so, but, but today, you have to have those options. It's, it's, it's changed. So I don't know if that's going to continue. I suspect it is the whole you know, movement of uh, health food and, and, and vegetables being so much better for you and, and the way that meat is going. Right now, I'm watching a, a thing on Netflix, and I think it's called Rotten. I think that's what it's called. And it's a whole series, and it's about um, massive food production in America. And I've, I've just finished the chicken one, and, I, and right now I'm doing the whole one about the milk. And it's pretty amazing. Um, what's happened, you know, of course, as we have lived through and seen, the small farmers is, is, is basically gone. And when I had my farm in Dansville, I lived next door to a dairy farmer, and I loved that guy's way of life. I went over and helped him milk every morning because he would give me free milk for my pigs. And I loved being up at four in the morning, uh, putting my hands up between the udders of a cow at zero degrees when it's winter, warming my hands and milking cows. That, I thought, was the life. And that's all gone. It's, it's just, it's totally, I mean, it's, now there are these huge industrial milk farms, and it's just, it's, you know, I can see why these vegans, they have a point. It's very horrific for an animal to live like that. You know, they're not running around in their natural environment. So, you know, there's, there's pros and cons to everything, and I think that um, it would be nice to see more farm-to-table, more small-time farmers going in and, and doing smaller things at smaller scale, and people paying, I mean, a gallon of milk is cheap, $2. I, I, I would, I, I used to drink a gallon of milk a day. I'm a big milk drinker. I've toned that down a little bit. But I think that paying $6 for a gallon of milk is not unreasonable. I mean, it's less than a six-pack of beer still. So I think that um, uh, for, I think for things to happen in the future in a good way is for more farmers to go smaller and raise prices and people locally to buy from those farmers. I think that would be a great thing to do for the future. Yes, Mike. Well, you know, it's funny because um, she has a fried chicken recipe in there, and it is as basic as you can possibly get. And that's how a lot of Southern food is. Um, it's it's um, chicken seasoned with salt and pepper, dusted in a little bit of flour, and fried perfect. And that's it. One of the key ingredients with that is they fry it in lard. Lard is huge. Now, my dad being a meat cutter, my dad would bring home the kidneys of the pig, surrounded by all that lard, and my mom would render it down. And we ate everything with lard. So, so much in this book is so relatable to me with the recipes, it's amazing. And I still, to today, buy lard. Wegman sells lard in a, like a one pound package like butter. And all my pies are made from lard. All my pie crust. I do all my frying in lard. And it's purified, so you don't, get, you don't quite get that, you know, that real good flavor of the pork, but it's, just like my phone on, sorry. But um, um, that the, the fried chicken recipe, basic, and, and she talks about how people do all kinds of different things. My recipe for fried chicken, I had a spiced flour. I marinated my chicken in buttermilk and hot sauce overnight, and then I double dipped. I'm not gonna tell you my double dip process, that's kind of my secret. Um, I double dipped in the buttermilk, floured, and then I double dipped in something else and then made my fried chicken, and I, it's just great. And so we're actually gonna be putting that on the menu at the Beachcomber as chicken fingers with that process, so that'll happen in the future. Yes, sir. Uh, Disney, uh, I was not impressed with anything as far as the food there at Disney. 
Uh, I, it's just, it's sad to me, but you know, they're trying to be a lot of multicultural, different things for people's different tastes. And having gone to Disney to, uh, 30 years ago, um, and then going now, and I haven't been to Disney in 10 years, that's the, the time span that I've been there since then. Um, there's a lot of different foods there now, and I've tried a couple of different things there. Uh, we went to this place called Ohana, which is one of the toughest restaurants to get into, uh, six month wait. We got lucky, there was a cancellation. Uh, it was like a fixed price, a prefix menu, and it was uh, it was like Hawaiian food, and it was okay, but it was just, it, most of the stuff tasted to me like bottled sauces, you know, everything was too sweet, too salty, too spicy, it just, there wasn't a very good, uh, you know, blend of anything, so I wasn't impressed with any of it. Um, there is a restaurant at MGM that I went to nine years ago, and it's still there, and I think it's called Mom's. It's set up like the 1950s. You sit down, there's a black and white TV at your table. It's the old Formica kitchen table, and you can get really good pot roast and really good meatloaf. And I remember that restaurant. And that was, and to me, comfort food is what my menu has always been based on, that kind of stuff. Yes? That uh, in Rochester, that I liked? Uh, Rocco's on Monroe Avenue, which is right as Monroe turns into uh, Chestnut, right there by the antique store. It's Rocco, R O C C O. And it's, it's, it's like a, a rustic Italian. He has um, pizzas, and then he does, he makes fresh ricotta cheese every morning from scratch. And his best-selling appetizer is this charred Italian bread where you spread it with that ricotta cheese. And it's unbelievable. And he just told me here about two weeks ago that somebody sent the bread back because it was burnt. And I'm just like, they don't deserve your food. Because people just, I mean, you want that char. You know, char right now, like charring stuff, like charring broccoli, charring um, uh, cauliflower, that's the, that's the thing now, charring your vegetables. You get that good flavor, and I love it. And uh, for people to say, oh, we, we sent it back because of that, I'm like, okay. That's, but he, he, he's an amazing chef. And then the second restaurant that I love was Lento, and that's in the Village Gate. And that's owned by Art Rogers. He's, he, um, he worked for uh, a place in, um, in Maine that was um, rated in the United States as one of the best restaurants called uh, Primo. And he is actually written about in a book um, written by Michael Ruhlman. If you know anything about cookbooks, Michael Ruhlman's written a lot of books. Oh, another thing I'll, I'll share with you is one of my favorite books to read um, pertaining to cooking is um, an author named Bill Buford. And I think he's only written one book on cooking and it's called Heat. And it's one of the few books that I've read three times. And it tells stories about Mario Batali, uh, how he went to Italy and, and, and uh, uh, the one of the most famous butchers in the world who lives in Italy. Uh, he tells about a couple other chefs, and he went and did sta what they call a stage, where when a chef travels around and cooks for people, um, usually for free, and gets to live above the restaurant. But um, that's one of my favorite books. It's called It's Heat by Bill Buford. And then the two restaurants are Lento and Rocco. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. <laughs> well, he did something right, right? Um, you know, and, and, and like I said, when you asked about her recipe, very plain, no spicing, just salt and pepper, whereas what the colonel had, what he, what he, it was like 16 spices, right? Is that what it was? Yeah. So I, um, once in a while, do like me some Kentucky Fried Chicken. I do like Popeyes, too. But um, if I'm going to make real fried chicken, like when my kids come home from, they're spread out all over the place, when my older kids come home, they always say uh, two things. I want fried chicken and I want your pancakes, because I make buttermilk pancakes from scratch, and they're amazing. So, I mean, if, if we just started doing my, I was known for my brunch in Rochester back before everyone was doing brunch, and we had lines out both doors. And um, um, it, it, uh, now a lot of people are trying to do brunch, and I still, I can't even find a good brunch that I like to go to so far, but I'm, I'm busy now. I kind of semi-retired, but then I got back in the restaurant business with a friend of mine's restaurant, and it's at the Beachcomber on Canisius Lake. We just started up our Sunday brunch, and my pancakes are there. So um, if anyone um, wants to come out for a little Sunday drive and try that, please do. It's fat. And my grits are there. My shrimp and grits are there. Hands down, the best shrimp and grits you'll ever have, I promise. But uh, the pancakes are from scratch. I whip up egg whites, and I fold them in meticulously. It's a labor of love making those pancakes. But they are, I don't eat pancakes. I don't like truck driver pancakes. But there are two places I eat pancakes. One is my pancakes, and the other is, I don't know if you've ever been to Fisher Station down by Eastview Mall, that guy can make pancakes. Yep, so that's good stuff. Yeah. Yes, sir. Mm, yeah. 
Right, and it's the same like those new induction burners where you put the pan on and it heats up immediately. I just had the, uh, I did a uh, local Iron Chef competition where they asked me to compete in, and I'd never cooked with induction, and that's what they had. I'm like, that was a nightmare for me. Um, as a chef, you always want a live flame. That's the only thing that, that you can cook with. And it's funny because the cottage, I live in a cottage now, Kinesh Lake, and they have an electric stove there, and I'm like, Okay, so I put a gas burner outside on the deck just so that I have gas cooking because you, as a chef, you want that, that you know, that flame. And if, if I'm doing tortillas, I, I love Mexican food. Um, my Mexican restaurant, I only had it for two years, then um, U of R bought my lease out. But um, if you're doing a tortilla, you need to have that flame to toast that tortilla on. Or like, like at Rocco's, you need that flame to toast that bread on. You, and, and then for control, nothing controls better than the dial of a flame up or down. Whereas the electric stuff, it's tough. Like you said, you lose control. You have to just, you know, do what I do, buy a gas burner. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, and they're beautiful, and they are, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. And it's funny because like when I cook, um, I cook everything on high. When, I, when I'm cooking a gas, it, it, it's cranked up. You know, as a chef, everything's cranked up high. And so um, uh, as far as finesse, you've got to be able to finesse that. And, and with, with electric, it's just you can't have that going high all the time because it turns on, turns off. It's just it's a, it drive me nuts. Well, any more? Uh, I want to thank you, everyone, for coming. I hope that um, it gave you insight on the book. Thank you. And, uh,